Yeah. For me, it's the first time seeing it. <laughs> yes. But uh, Mr. Vidya Sagar is currently a distinguished professor in IIT uh, Hyderabad. Uh, let me just say a few things. He's had many positions, so he was uh, heading a you know, system biology science effort at uh, Texas at Dallas. At uh, TCS, he was heading the he was, uh, director of the uh, Advanced Technology Center. He was heading the uh, Advanced Technology Center. And at DRDO, he was director of the Center for Artificial Intelligence and Robotics. Uh, he had many, many accolades. Uh, so he's a fellow of Royal Society. That's very few people from India. Uh, he was uh, amongst the youngest to become the IEEE Fellow worldwide for 35 years old. And his PhD was uh, when he was 21 years old, he got his PhD. Uh, so he doesn't like too much discussion. Well, he's very young at heart. He doesn't like too much discussion about age and all that. But I should mention that he's a child of independence, of Indian independence. 1947, just post independence. <laughs> Welcome. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Sanjay, for a nice introduction. Yeah, the, the one thing you can't change is your age, so you pretty much have to deal with it as a, and, uh, I hope I'm dealing with it all day. So, when uh, yeah, I was invited to give a lecture here, I thought about this particular topic, which is kind of my latest uh, uh, area of uh, focus, let me say. I won't say research because it's not clear I have got a whole lot to contribute. So there's a little bit of a story here. Um, in 2020 fall semester at Berkeley, they have this thing called Simon's Institute, very famous place. So they had a one semester long program on reinforcement learning. So they invited me to be what they call the chancellor's professor and to give a lecture. I've said to give a course on reinforcement learning. So then I said, okay, I will talk about reinforcement learning. And I, this was in February 2020. Then two things happened. First thing is the pandemic shut down all travel. And second, I myself got a fairly severe case of COVID in July. But by then, this course was advertised in Berkeley. And they had something like 50 students signed up. So canceling it was not an option. So basically I wound up teaching the course remotely, sitting in Hyderabad and Berkeley time. So that was quite character building from 10.30 PM to midnight. So. <laughs> but anyway, uh, at that point, I, I'm not wearing a mask because it will be very indistinct if I do that. Is that okay? Okay. So. Then I started putting together some kind of notes and what struck me about reinforcement learning is so many algorithms and there, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of unifying methodology from the crews. So finally, after a lot of looking, I felt that this stochastic approximation algorithm in its various authors is actually a good unifying approach, okay? And then I also discovered a kind of um, simple proof of the convergence of this algorithm. I wasn't really the first one to do it. Now, just one quick question. On the icon, I'm blocking the screen, but I, the, the viewers can see me without. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Right. So, without any further delay, let's get on to this. So, here is the um, set of contents. So here's a problem formulation for reinforcement learning. We'll come to stochastic approximation a little bit later. So let's say that you have some finite step X. That's supposed to be the state space of a Markov process. I hope at least people know what a Markov process is. Right? And then the state transition matrix is A. So in my notation, A I J is the probability that the next state is xj given that the current state is xr. So the first index is the current state, the next second index is the next state. Now, we're talking about something called Markov reward processes. So here the idea is that in addition to this dynamic, there is also a reward function. And what the reward function does, 
is to each state it gives a real number. Okay. Now, because x is a finite set, this reward is a bounded function because there is only finite energy. Value. Then there's also a number of gamma strictly less than one called the discount factor. So for each initial state, xi, you define this quantity, which is called V star. So this is the expected value of the return at time t, but discounted by this factor gamma. So the later the reward comes, the less it is useful to you. All this is conditioned on starting at the initial state excellent. Now the, the quantity inside some was random, so you get expected value. And there are no technicalities here, everything is finite. So for example, you can stick the E here instead of outside the sum, it doesn't make any difference. So we want to calculate this vector V star, and you can call it um, the reward vector at the Rx1, Rx2, and so forth. And you know, these are finite sets. So the order of the component really doesn't matter so long as you're consistent. All you really have to do is make sure you put the same order in there that you put here. You know, that doesn't make any difference. Then it's pretty easy to show that this value vector V star satisfies this recursion. V star equals R plus gamma A into V star. Now remember, A is a state transition metric. So if you look at its uh, induced norm with respect to the infinity vector norm is exactly equal to one. Now you are multiplying by this number gamma, which is strictly smaller than one. Therefore, uh, this matrix definitely has an inverse identity minus gamma A. So you can calculate V star by just writing I minus gamma A inverse into R. But the problem is, in the worst case, <clears throat> the complexity is going to be cubic and the number of states. That's not a very smart idea. So another approach is you just simply observe that this map um, that takes V into the reward plus gamma times A V is a contraction, again, with respect to an infinity norm. And all you're trying to do is that solve a fixed point problem. Therefore, all you have to do is pick some initial starting point and keep applying this map over and over and over, and it will convert eventually. Not only that, you can even get estimates of how far you are from the solution. The problem is that in most um, re uh, reinforcement learning problems, gamma is very, very close to one. So, yes, theoretically, this converges, but it's going to be pretty slow. <clears throat> so, then what happens? In 1988, Richard Sutton, who, can, who you can say is a, one of the pioneers of uh, reinforcement learning, he introduced a concept which he called temporal difference learning. And the idea here is quite simple. It's not necessarily any faster than either of the two methods I showed on the previous slide. But it requires less storage because at each instant of time you update only one time. So there is a, a more general version called TD lambda, where lambda is any number between uh, zero and one. Conceptually, it's the same as what I'm going to show you, but there's more messy notation. So I'm going to talk about only TD zero, even though the theory applies to TD lambda as well. So how does this work? So you have this Markov process with the state transition matrix A. So you just generate any sample path. Keep generating x to x0, x1, x2 with any initial state, doesn't make any difference. And then uh, just for notational convenience, I will define what I call the coordinate process. So the coordinate process is X of t, x of t equals x i. If f, if x of t equals x i, then n of t equals i. It's basically just a bookkeeping device, and you can see that n of t is just an integer value Markov process with exactly the same dynamics as x itself. So how the TD algorithm works? How does it work? 
start with any old initial vector, but yes, so now you're getting the whole vector, not just one component. So then you pick some initial state, let the Markov process around. And remember, I had this coordinate process which tells you which state you're at. So at time t, you compute this quantity called delta, it's called the temporal vector. So I'm going to spend a minute to go over this because it's a very crucial concept. So at time t, <clears throat> the coordinate process is half the value and up. <clears throat> so think of V of T as the approximate vector at time t. So it's a d-dimension, it's an n-dimensional vector. So if you look at the n teeth component of that, that is where the Markov process is right now. Then you look at where did the Markov process at the next time instead. And you look at the same approximation V of T, but computed at the next time instead. Multiply by gamma, and then take again the reward. <coughs> at the current state. And the difference between this quantity and that quantity is the um, temporal difference of delta. So you can simplify the notation by saying if the current state is xi and the next state is xj, then the temporal difference is the rewarded state i plus gamma times the rewarded state j minus v at state i. So and having calculated this temporal difference, you update the vector v <coughs> by changing only the i component. That means where the Markov chain is right now. You update that component. You will leave the rest of them alone. Don't change it. So the advantage of this procedure is that the story is you have this huge approximate vector v. You only pull out one component at a time, update it, and put it. Right. So the question, of course, is all right. It's a very easy algorithm to describe, but when does it work? Unfortunately, if you want to find out, you have to come back tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, computation is also much less because huh? computation is also much less here. Computation is much less. <coughs> there's, there's no major vector. There's no multiplication. You're just looking up. You, there's no, there is no computation of any kind. You're in the current state here. You have the sample part of the Markov process, you have the current guess, you just figure out what is the component at the <coughs> next state of the Markov process. That's it. There's no, there's no computation. So it's a very easy algorithm. So, <clears throat> so <clears throat> now, up to now I talked about Markov reward processes. So let's talk about Markov decision process. <clears throat> so here the idea is, in addition to the state space, you also have something which I call action space. And this terminology is not entirely standard. The control, you know, to talk to uh, the control theory community, people like the worker, for example, they used to call this as controlled Markov chains. But now somehow the preferred terminology appears to be the Markov decision process. So here the idea is that you have m different actions that you can take. And typically, m is much, much smaller than n. And there are many practical examples of Markov decision processes where m is exactly two. Now, you can't have m like equal to one because there's nothing to decide, obviously. So two is the theoretical minimum, and there are many interesting problems where m is exactly two. So for example, if you play this game called Blackjack, Begin at the house. There are only two things you can do. Either you can draw one more card, which is called hit it, or you stay where you are, which is called stay. Okay. But that's a very realistic application. Now, corresponding to each one of these um, actions, there is a state transition method AU1 to AUM. And the most important concept here is what is called a policy. A policy is just a way of assigning actions to states. So it's just a way of saying that if the current state is this, the next act, the action is this one. 
<laughs> so how many of them are there? Well, you can easily see the number of uh, possible policies is m raised to the power of n. So this can be really, really fast. So enumerating policy is not a very smart thing to do. In fact, I'll show you the tomorrow stuff. It's impossible in most situations. So there are m different state transition matrices. So how do you interpret them? <coughs> if the current state is x sub i, and you have chosen a policy phi, you know, there's a mass from x to u, then the probability that the next state is j is given by the ij component of this transition matrix a pi of xi. Pi of xi is the action that you get when the current state is xi. Now, it's not, at least I don't think it's intuitively obvious why this is a Markov process, but it is. Okay. You probably have to stare at it a little bit to convince yourself that what happened before time t doesn't make any difference, but this is also a Markov. So no matter what function you define from x to u, if you define the state transition matrix in this way, you still get a mark up. So because what is happening here is that at each time in span, you are choosing the state transition matrix from a different mark up process depending on where you happen to be in the action state. But it doesn't matter. Now what about the reward? If the policy was randomized, then this would not be a mark it will be. It will still be. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, even if you choose a randomized policy, it's still a Markov process. What happens is that you wind up taking a convex combination of all the state transition matrices. So it's still, it's still a Markov process. Yeah. Now, the, one of the standard results in uh, Markov decision processes is that whatever you can do with the randomized policy, you can also do with the deterministic policy. So, I mean, so in my notes, which I'm writing, uh, I show that this is the case. And therefore, hereafter, we stick to only deterministic policies. But for the purposes of this lecture, I decided not to mention the randomized policies at all. Okay. So now, yeah. You can, but then why do you gain by that? You're actually making it bigger. So my point is that once you choose pi, you have a Markov process and a small set, which is x. So you don't gain anything by saying it's a Markov process and a bigger set. Pi is deterministic. Pardon me? Pi is deterministic. Well, no, actually, pi can be randomized also, but pi is specified. You're not changing pi in the middle of the process. That's all the thing that matters. You start with a particular policy. You say the state is one, I'm going to do action three, you say it is three, I'm going to do action five, or you can make it random also. So long as you don't change pi, it is still a mark of course. Okay. On x, not on x times u. So there is no benefit to expanding the state space x times u and making it bigger when it is actually a mark of process on a much smaller state. Okay. That's why I said this is the one of the most non intuitive parts of. Uh, Mark up decision process, but it's true what I say. Okay. <laughs> That's exactly right. So, what I would say is that for the first action, you may take the first row, for the second action, you may take the second row, and so on. And to go back to Sandeep's question, what happens if you have a randomized policy? Depending on what the randomized probabilities are, you assign different weights to the different rows of these matrices, and that gives you the new. A state transition. So that's why it is a mark of process. So now what happens to the reward? Earlier, the reward just assigned values to states. Now it assigns values to state action pay. So we do the same thing as we did before. Once you choose the uh, policy, you start out with some initial state x sub i, let the Markov process run according to these rules, and then you're going to get some rewards, keep discounting them, and then take the expected value. Now, this is the value of the policy. Earlier, we had only b of x sub 
y because it depended only on what x and y was. But now it depends both on x and y as well as the policy. So the whole point in mass of decision processes is to find an optimal policy that maximizes this value overall. And there are a few subtleties here. For example, it's a priori not obvious that there's one policy that you should the best value for every state. But there is. So these are all little things that I sort of swapping over in my notes. They will get finished on this stuff in the really great detail. So people were trying to figure out how do you find the optimal policy. Uh, enumerating, let me go back to the previous slide. Enumerating all policies is definitely not an option because there are far too many options. So there was a big breakthrough in 1992, 30 years ago, by Watkins and Diane. If I'm not mistaken, Diane was a faculty at Imperial College and Watkins was a student. And they introduced something called an action value function. So this is the Q, which maps the state action space into real numbers. Okay. And it's defined like this. But we'll, I'll leave the star aside for just a moment. To take R of X I UK, as it was the function of two arguments, plus gamma times summation J equals one to N, A I J X UK times the maximum overall possible action. So again, it can be shown that if you take any function Q, not Q star necessarily, but any function Q, and you do this exercise, you get again a contraction. It's not as obvious as in the other case, because of this maximum. So this is no longer a linear map as it was earlier, but this is also a contraction. So because it's a contraction, there is a unique solution Q star that satisfies this recursion relationship. And if you ever succeed in finding such a true star, then the optimal reach star, the optimal value you can get over all possible policies is simply this number, the maximum of this action value function over all actions. And the optimal policy is just the R map, the one that gives you. So the point here is that this R map need not be unique. So you could have multiple optimal policies, but you definitely have only one optimal value. So a crew learning algorithm is very similar in principle to TD that I mentioned earlier. You start with some arbitrary initial function Q0, which maps X and U, X and U to real numbers, and some initial state. One of the interesting points here is that nobody tells you how to choose the next action, and I'll come to that in a minute. So at time t, you have the current state, you choose some current action, how up to you. Then let the mass of process run for one time step with that state transition making, where you choose that. Suppose the next state turns out to be xj. Then what you do is, you calculate this quantity, the reward at xi, you take current state, current action, minus the q function, again, at the current state, current action, but this term is now different. It's now gamma Vt of xj, which is the next state. And what is Vt? It's the maximum of the function q, q of t, that is your current guess, over all possible action, given that this x is the next observed state. Do you follow me? It's a bit of a mess, but it's conceptually not any different from the td0. Uh, yeah, so we had this value equation of V, and now we have this Q. Have we gained anything by doing this? Uh, yes, you have. Conceptually, it seems like it's just more messy. Than stuff. No, actually, well, as I said, I, I have to sort of half finished notes. Uh, so, what happens in the uh, when you go to the VK, it turns out that the maximum is there outside the expectation. Yes. So that makes it uh, highly nonlinear. And this is actually much easier. So, for example, uh, 
If the number of actions is very small, you get off and in, then that max is nothing. Is that you can even do that by enumeration. Mm -hmm. Now, in complexity theory, enumeration is considered bad, but not when the number of possibilities is small. This is much easier to implement. But is there a theorem which says okay, human learning is better than this learning because of this reason? I'm actually not well, there are some statements of that effect, but you know, this this area is quite ripe with the things that look plausible but unproven. So it looks like Q learning should be better than directly trying to learn waste time. Mm -hmm. Now there is something called the Bellman recursion, which I've chosen not to show you because I don't have time. So that what you can do is you can directly calculate V star mm -hmm. by solving a different recursion. But the problem is that in order to do that, you have to have two, two contraction maps running one inside the other. So then you have to wait for the inner contraction map to run infinitely many times. So that there's a technical difficulty with that. Whereas with Q star, you don't, so basically what you're doing is doing this kind of like updating with Q of T, which is already an approximate value. It's not the exact one. So that's a perceived advantage. But in terms of theoretical guarantee, none. If it is a finite time, then it this would be like the dynamic programming reference. Yes, all of them are basically dynamic program. Even the V star that I said I'm not going to show you, that is the Bellman principle of optimality. These are all just basically dynamic programming approaches saying that if you take an optimal path, any piece of that is also optimal. It's saying the same thing. Okay. So this also requires a proof that an optimal deterministic policy exists. Right? That by doing a randomization, you don't achieve anything better. Yeah. And that's another way of doing this. And then uh, even when I was writing my notes, uh, I've been thinking whether I should do this or not. Okay. Um, think of the set of all policies, probabilistic and deterministic, as a convex set, which it is. Because all you're doing is for each state, you're assigning a bunch of weights to what weight do I give to you one, what weight do I give to you two, and so on. So, Okay. So the set of all policies you can think of as a convex. So what are the extreme points of this convex? So this is a realistic policy. Now, when you try to maximize a linear function over a convex set, where are the solutions? They're always going to be the extreme points. Okay. That's another way of understanding why we don't gain anything by using randomized uh, policies. Whatever you can do with randomized policies, you can do with deterministic policies. So, so here's the focus of the two talks. But I've been myself educating my, myself to teach this course at Berkeley, um, which is a little like a little about over a year and a half ago. I discovered there's so many algorithms, temporal difference, Q learning. Then there is something called actual critic function approximation. And I uh, sort of tear my head of what is going on here. And, uh, and then <laughs> this slightly sarcastic comment and a variety of proof if they exist at all. And I do mean that there are many things that are just thrown at you with no proof at all. Okay. It works in simulation. What more do you want? Something like that. Okay. So then I figured out all right. If I'm going to write a set of notes for students, I should use some unifying theme. It's not may not be truly unifying in the sense that you may not get the best result for every possible problem, but you get reasonably close. And the students are not having to learn a whole bunch of uh, one of a kind algorithm. So that finally zero in on stochastic approximation as a unifying theme. Uh, tool. So today I'm going to talk about standard stochastic approximation, primarily because it gives you the starting point for tomorrow's talk, which is called BASA, bad asynchronous stochastic approximation. It's quite a mouthful. So we decided to call it BASA. So today's paper is just by me, and tomorrow's paper is with the professor Kadir. Okay. Now, 
If you look at the titles of this talk, we say using Congress to have enough theory. Uh, if, if, if I had an hour and a half instead of an hour, I would have told you um, what is Congress lab enough theory and what does that have to do with stochastic approximation. But because I don't have that much time, I'm going to skip this part. But you can see that it is there in the slides. I'm going to leave my slides with the organizer. So you're welcome to read it at your leisure. Okay, let's get back to the stochastic approximation. So this particular problem was formulated by Robinson and Monroe. So you can tell us the historical formulation of Markov first. Huh? Who formulated the Markov first? Ah, it. Well, uh, I mean, I'm not sure. I think that the well, the, I'm not sure about the phraseology Markov decision process. Mm. I think. Bellman certainly had a role in it, mm -hmm. but Bellman pretty much called them controlled Markov processes. And like what Piyush was saying, you know, then this whole recursion equation being the dynamic programming version for Markov, controlled Markov chain, it was very natural. But <clears throat> I don't know exactly when the transition took place from the phrase all the controlled Markov chains of processes. To mark up decision classes. Ron Hubbard. Ron Hubbard. Ron Hubbard is a good guess. It's quite possible. I mean, I, if, if I had to make a guess, I'd probably guess around now. Any other questions? So, this original problem of Robinson Monroe was the following. So, you take some function f mapping Rv. D. Now, why have I suddenly introduced D? Because in a value iteration, the dimension of the problem is n, which is the number of states. In the action value iteration, the number of variables is n times m, the number of states times the number of actions. So I just chose the neutral symbol D because I just want one theory that works every time. Okay. So you can also think D is the dimension of the problem. So you want to find a solution to this equation f of theta equals zero. <clears throat> now the challenge is that you have only noisy measurements of the function. So at each time step, so you start with some initial density. I also change the notation from x and u to theta again to make it neutral so that we don't care what it is that you are at the independent variable. So you start with the initial guess theta zero, and at a particular time t, what you have is the function whose zero you're trying to find at the current guess, corrupted by some measurement mark CFT guess. Now this mismatch in time instead by one is basically to keep the bookkeeping straight because this is the current state. Now you want to update at the next time instant, so you measure the function. But in the process, you have incurred some measurement error, but that's going to affect you at the next time. So that's the reason. So then what you do is you update theta of t to theta of t plus one by taking the measurement y of t, multiplying by some step size alpha of t. You can see one more no, that's So in today's talk, alpha of t is a predetermined sequence of step sizes. Deterministic number. In tomorrow's talk, there are going to be random numbers. And that's sort of the intellectual jump between standard stochastic approximation and asynchronous stochastic approximation. <clears throat> so the question is oh, when does this converge to theta star? Where theta star is the solution of this equation. Now, because everything is random here, the convergence is going to be only probabilistic if at all. Yeah, if you don't have any noise, what this is doing is minimizing norm f of theta square using the stateless descent technique. No. So suppose you say, suppose I define some quantity g. Okay. 
This is the equation of a type of theory. So what you do is you take theta t plus one equal to theta t plus some step size and the property. Because the gradient of that quantity is just that t. Now the question is why do you have a plus sign or minus sign? <clears throat> and it really depends on what you expect f to look like. So in other words, if F looks like let's just do a one-dimensional problem. So if F looks like this, then we put a positive sign. If it looks like the mirror image, then you put a minus. So that's the logic behind it. So it's just the steepest descent method if you do it as minus. So when you say gradient, you don't mean the gradient with the theta. The with respect to F theta. F theta. Yeah. Because there is, okay, I see. There is no. So this is not there. This is not there. It is that you try to do the research in the F of theta space. So the question is when does this converge? So we are assuming it is a unique theta star for which it finds us. So we are assuming it is a unique theta star. No. I mean, it certainly makes life much easier if there is a unique solution. Uh, and that's again for the purposes of today's talk. Because we know that the I'm going to assume there's only one solution. And then if I look at this, let's just look ahead a little bit. That, um, so if you look at this difference in position, theta dot is equal to f of theta. This has uh, one unique globally attractive. Okay. Now you can go beyond that. It gets fairly messy though. So this is good enough for most situations. So Correct answer to your question is in today's talk, yes, I'm going to assume that. Is it absolutely necessary? No, it's not. All right. So, everybody knows Robbins Monroe, but very few people know Kiko Gulfovic Blum, which is kind of an unfortunate thing. Uh, and going a bit slower than I thought, mainly because of the bunch of solutions, a bunch of questions. Do we have to go out to be a shark at five o'clock? Or... Oh, okay, we'll go five ten minutes. So what the what this guy's did, keep the wolf away. Now Robert Monroe was a good one. So very next year these guys came out with another paper, a testimony to the very short review cycles 50 years ago, 70 years ago. It would never happen today, okay? But anyway, here's the point. This is suppose I have a function J, which is a scalar value function. And you want to find a stationary point of J. So you're just looking for a solution to the equation gradient of J equals to zero. And I put C1 or C2 because depending on what theorem you're proving, I gather you have one differential or five differential. So what, what is it you are measuring? Suppose you are measuring just the negative gradient of J plus some noise. This is the same problem as this one. You just take f of theta equals j of the minus j of the gradient of j of the that's it. But what different ones of it did was something very really different. They said if your current base is theta of t and there are d dimensions of this vector, systematically you perturb theta in the ith coordinate in the negative direction and in the positive direction. And then calculate a first order difference as an approximation to the gradient. But you also have measurement errors when you do that. So let's call it the measurement error on the negative direction, measurement error in the positive direction. So now, if you can rewrite this same formula as I showed on the previous sheet, like this, this bit here. 
uh, C of t goes to zero, which is what you want. You want to make these increments smaller and smaller. This is becoming a better and better approximation to the true gradient. That's the good news. The bad news is you are dividing this by C of t. So the noise variance is approaching infinity. So the technical challenge in the keeper wolfowitz formulation is how do you get convergence to zero of the gradient in spite of measurement noises whose variance is actually approaching infinity? Okay. So Kiefer and Wolfowitz had some ad hoc procedure. It wasn't that pretty. But what the Blum did was they enunciated these conditions. So these are the conditions of Robinson Monroe. The, I think anybody who's ever seen stochastic approximation has seen this condition, even if they don't necessarily know why it is possible. First thing is that the subset sequence is squared from multiple but divergent. And Blum was the first to give these conditions that now you have two things changing here. One is the alpha of t, which is the step size, and c, which I call the increment. So this is the first order approximation to the gradient. So he said c of t has to go to zero. This summation is finite, that summation is finite, and this summation is infinite. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm saying to you that this is sort of superfluous, and later on I'll show you that you don't need it actually. And it's pretty obvious why. If you look at it. This summation is divergent. But this summation is convergent. How can that be? Basically, C of K has to go to zero. No other way. I mean, you can start talk about limb influence, super, and all that, but that's all technicality. Basically, C has to go to zero. Okay, I'll skip this bottom part, not really very really important. So now we finally come to the theorem statement. I'm going to be a bit precise here. So somebody asked, I am assuming a unique solution for the purpose of this stuff only, right? So there's only unique solution. And at time t, theta zero t denote the entire past history of the process. And f of t denote the sigma algebra generated by the all the guesses plus the noise. Okay. And there is no c one, uh, there is no c zero. The noise starts at time one. So the first assumption we make is that the noise is unbiased. So that means, uh, beg your pardon, the measurements are unbiased. That means the conditional expectation of the noise with respect to the past sigma algebra is zero. So if you don't understand what uh, conditional sigma algebra is, conditional expectation, it basically just the measurements are unbiased. Second thing is, uh, because the expected value of that is zero, the variance is just the expectation of the Euclidean norm. Because the, the linear term basically disappears. And in the original paper, they assume that this is bounded by some quantity V, some fixed constant. But I'm going to be a little more liberal. I'm going to say the noise variance can actually keep growing as uh, the process goes on, right? And the robbins monroe conditions, which I've seen already, that the step sizes are diverted and the step sizes are squared. So the point here is that a typical theorem before the year 2000 looked like this. It said, suppose that F was to remove a unique solution, N was zero expected mean that growing conditional variance. And S is the step size condition, Robbins motion. And if, if S satisfies some more condition, I don't know what kind of a mathematics is that? We don't say things like that. Because next slide, I'm going to actually make a precise statement because the title of this slide is a typical theorem. This is what they used to describe. Okay. So there were examples where it was not bounded to single Let's yes, yes. Yeah. So, but the point is that part in uh, Maroon, mm -hmm. the typical data would say if the iterations are bounded almost surely, <clears throat> then the iterations will converge to the solution. 
the how do you know that if it's not bounded almost really what your problem i mean it's not the problem of the person who proved the theorem okay so that's the way these theorems work for between 1951 to 2000 almost 50 years so this part this part was called stability and this part was called conversion so the typical theorem said if the iterations are stable then they convert so Everybody was saying, now wait a minute, can we make the stability of the iteration a conclusion instead of being a hypothesis? And this was achieved by our good friend uh, Rivet, um, Sean Lyon in 2000, <coughs> the first paper, as far as I'm aware, to get rid of this assumption that the iterations are bounded and make it a conclusion. So, therefore, I'm going to state this theorem precisely. So, they said, okay, standard assumption. They assume that this function f is globally Lipschitz continuous. And they also assume that there is a limit function. So you look at this f of r theta divided by r. As you let r go to infinity, there is a limit function f of theta. And this thing converges to that limit function uniformly over complex sets. Now, this function, as you can see, is what's called a scale invariant function. Because of the way we have defined it, it's scale invariant. So its dynamics are relatively simpler. And I'll define this in the next slide. You know the global exponential stable equilibrium of this differential equation. With differential equation, not with the original f, but with the limit function of theta. So if all these conditions hold, uh, okay, so. Global Lipschitz continuity, I think if people have taken a course in ODEs, they know that with global Lipschitz continuity, there's always a unique solution, right? And exponential stability simply means that the difference between the current solution and the equilibrium is bounded by some constant and the initial mismatch and the decaying exponential term. That's global exponential stability. I mean, where is the pi? So pi is only in the previous slide. Pi is only zero uh, is a stability point for the limit function. Yeah, that's what I said. That's, that's the zero. Now I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to talk in terms of where <coughs> the desired solution is a globally exponentially stable equilibrium of that function. I'm going to do that next. But I'm just quoting the Borker mind theorem as they proved it. Okay. Is that your question? So I'm trying to say that uh, for it might be evident for the bound of part uh, after some k to the ADR zero in the equilibrium state of the ODPF uh, theta dot equals to a part theta. Yes, that the it will definitely happen because look at what is this function doing. You take your current initial condition, kick it off by a factor of r, then you speed up the dynamics by a factor of r. So, what you're saying could very definitely happen. That is why this is a stronger assumption. And that's why I said that in, in my presentation, I'm going to actually get rid of that assumption. What function satisfies that typically? What are you using? Linear function. That's it. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's pretty restrictive. So, <laughs> but if the company with passing will work, if you huh? take a quadratic function and then after a while patch it. No, anything like that will do. But see, the problem with all the saturating types of functions is that they are not ever, ever going to satisfy it. See, if you take up with it sort of growing nicely and then flattens out, this condition, this condition will definitely not hold. Because the farther you are from the solution, the more slowly you start converging. So it's a pretty fine balance you have to strike between the two. Okay. So this is a both of my theorem. 
Under these conditions, the solute depresses are bounded almost surely and they convert to the right here. So, so this is uh, the stability is a conclusion, not a hypothesis. So that is the first theory of action you do this. Now, this is based on something called the ODE method, which states that the sample parts of the iterations convert to the determinist solu deterministic solution of this ODE. Again, to go to your question, this is a solution of with F in that's why I put the cursor there. Solution of theta dot equals F of infinity of theta, not the original F, right? So uh, basically, a bunch of people pioneered the ODE of Leonard Jung, Deveritsky, and Protkov, more or less simultaneously discovered it in 1974. Kushner and Clark had a much different uh, book. And then there's a nice survey paper by Metabia and Triure, which is probably the most readable description of it. It's a short survey paper. So I looked at this and I said there must be an easier way of doing this. That's what I usually do, I'm not very smart. So typically my researcher comes to say, oh God, there must be an easier way to do this. And then I start trying to find an easier way. Right. Well, amazingly enough, while looking through the literature, I found that in 1965, there was a paper by this Russian guy, Vladishev. They actually had a very easy proof, really easy. But the only, Shortcoming of the Ajishev was it did not apply to all functions f. It applied to only those functions f that satisfy this condition, which for a continuous function is just simply saying that. So if you talk, if you look at this in a one dimension, it just simply says it sort of looks like this. It's like a first and what are the second and fourth quadrant function. So that function will look something like this. This is theta, and this is f of theta, and this is theta star. So the function part of looks like this. On one side is negative, on the other side is positive. So, and I looked at this proof, this is very nice, very, very good proof. Uh, is there anywhere going beyond this assumption? And how crucial is it? Because this paper is three pages long, by the way. Three. So if you have ever seen any of the literature in this subject, you would know kind of what an amazing <laughs> achievement that is. So what he does is, he does an affine transformation of the norm theta square, and then he adjusts this constant A of T and B of T, determines the constant in such a way that this transformed quantity Z of T, a transformed stochastic process Z of T, is a non negative supermodel. And as I said, if you don't know what it is, don't worry about it. But the point is, it's way less technical than the body method. Now, the beauty of Glass's method is this so called clear division of labor. The way his theorem says if the step sizes are squares on the vertex, then the iterations are bounded almost surely. If on top of that, the step sizes diverge, then you get convergence. You understand? Whereas in the case of uh, Vivek, Borkar, and Schoenman, there is no such division of labor. They use both conditions in both cases. So my motivation was okay, are we coming to this zone? Problem is, this applies only to these functions, this class of functions. But you're so pretty, I say, okay, I have to find a better way of doing this. So I could do it using. Uh, Conversely, Laplace to find a Laplace function when uh, the differential equation is doable exponentially stable. But I'm going to skip all that because of the uh, shortage of time. But I will show you. Yeah, I, I should finish in about eight ten minutes. I'm going to show you what is called the framework for convergence proofs. So this is about as easy as you can get, okay? There are no hidden technicalities, this is it. If you take a probability space, F is a filtrate, so that means the increase in sequence of signal of the dust. And X of T is a non-negative stochastic process that is adapted to F of T. All that means is at each time T, X of T is measurable with respect to F of T, right? 
And W of T is a sum of these equal to positive numbers such that the conditional expectation of X T plus one satisfies this bound. Almost surely. Then X of T is all there almost surely. And then the random variable, there is a random variable zeta. So that X of T converges to zeta almost surely. And before somebody asked me, is it only almost sure? Are in the mean? No, you don't get in the mean. You get only almost sure because we haven't made any assumptions that. So if you have an L one stochastic process, this is all you can do. Again, if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. It's technical. Does this condition deserve a name? So it's right stepping up the lightness. Okay, uh, let me show you I'll, two slides. I'll give you the answer to that. So now suppose you change it a little bit. Now you have two sequences, one is square summable, one is derivative. And what I have done is it's a one plus w times x, I have one plus w minus u times x. Okay. And then x of t is bounded almost surely and converges almost surely to zero. So I discovered this and I was very happy. Okay. Then I discovered that there's an old paper by Robert and Sigmund. Not a journal paper, but in some conference workshop. So, you know, in the pre archive era, to find a paper presented in some conference is essentially impossible. But they had the first lemma and not exactly the second lemma. But the real joke is when I finally got a hold of that paper, they said they were not aware of Gladysheff's paper. So, a lot of rediscovery going on here. So, Sigmund and uh, Robin and Sigmund rediscovered the uh, Gladyshev, I sort of rediscovered Gladyshev, uh, I sort of rediscovered Robinson Sigmund. But if you actually read Gladyshev's paper very carefully, my so called framework is there. So if you want to call it anything, you should call it the Gladyshev approach. Okay. Now there is an even older paper by a guy called Dvoretsky, and it's also sort of getting there. So I mean, it's not clear whose name you just put. But the only point I can say. That, uh, yeah, I definitely did discover this on my own. So, anyway, bottom line new Conway theorem for uh, GES, convert to skip, as I mentioned. So, let's go to convergence of stochastic approximation. It's now five o'clock, so I should finish. So, here's your theorem. First, we assume that there's only one solution. Again, your question that you're asking, right? Second, uh, my function whose solution you're trying to find is not in the This is the extra condition we have. The type of I don't know how to get rid of it. What does this say? For each index i, you look at this function f of i, calculate its Hessian. I put supremum now, but obviously you can put in norm you feel like they are all equal in any way. So you take the norm of the Hessian multiplied by the distance from the equilibrium. That has to remain bounded. Okay. So what it essentially means is that, oh, okay. If it is linear, what is the Hessian? Hessian is zero. Okay, no worries about that. So this is not quite that bad. All it says is it doesn't have to have a zero Hessian, but it has to get smaller and smaller the farther you are from the equilibrium. And it has to go, this point has to go to zero faster than this part is going to infinity. So that the product remains bounded. That's what this is. And then, so does it work for the quadratic? No, 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 no. No, in fact, the, not that my case, but nobody here works when theta dot equals uh, minus theta cube, that everything it doesn't work at all. Because this is what happens is then the gradient is not the fixed on the units. And that's a crucial assumption in our own scale. So you would sort of think that just look at theta dot equals minus theta q. The farther you are away, it actually comes very fast. You think that should help you. But somehow nobody has figured out a way of uh, exploiting that in the scale. Quadratic will have limited fixed gradient. Huh? So quadratic has limited gradient, but even that is. No, no, quadratic. No, 
If alpha is quadratic, it's not below the matrix Look at this, three. Problem zero. Every three. Problem zero. Problem you can have you can come up with examples where if it's quadratic it actually has finite escape time and things like that so anyway so here my theorem it looks very much like Lattice's theorem if the sequence is squared from a root then the iterations are bounded almost surely if on top of it the subset is also diverse then the equations converge to the answer thickest one. Okay. So what is the comparison between Gladyshare? <clears throat> Gladyshare creates a super here by doing an affine transformation of norm theta squared, and I do an affine transformation of the Lapinov function here of theta. So that is where this converse Lapinov theory comes in to show that there exists a function V that can do the job. Now, if gradual self conditions hold, you know that kind of function, which is like a first and third, second and fourth quadrant, then you can just take norm theta squared as the lab function. So it's a very natural uh, con uh, continuity between the earlier method and mine. That's the last substantive result. I just wanted to mention a few other points. So, so what's the difference between uh, mine and uh, both of mine? My in the sense of M I N E and my in the sense of M U Y N. Okay, the difference is so Borker and Sean, that is uh, the debate and the uh, great Borker and Sean line, they have this assumption that the scale free limit actually exists. I don't need any such thing. But then they don't have this condition which I need. So it is not directly comparable one way or the other. Now, Sean, he actually did something very nice. He said that if this function f infinity exists, which they need, and on top of it, it has a globally bound resistor, then it will satisfy my hypothesis. So with this extra text shown in Maroon, then their theorem comes as a special case of this. Now, all right, so I don't want to tax your patience too much. This is definitely, and nobody has done this before, that is to apply the super martingale approach to Kiefer Wolfowitz Blum approach. And remember, I told you the real problem is that because we're dividing by C key, the variance of the noise is actually going to infinity. So I'll stick with this condition, you can read them later. But here is what the theorem looks like. If you have a couple of summations being finite, then the iterations converge almost above are bounded almost surely, even though the noise variance is going to infinity. If on top of it, the step cells are divergent, then in fact the iterations converge to zero. I just changed theta star to zero for ease of exposition. Okay, so let me take two minutes to skip the direction. Uh, one is the situation. Is for exponential stability. I'm trying to figure out how to extend the theory to this situation. Mm -hmm. Because it is exactly what you mentioned, the function goes up and then flattens up. So, this is global asymptotically stable, but not global exponential. This is a much more interesting problem. So, my original field is control theory. And if you look at control theory problem, especially what is called system identification problem, it turns out the measurement error. Does not have a zero. Okay. And it's like a fundamental limitation. It's not that through clever reorganization you can make it zero. Make inherently is a biased measure. Okay. So what can you do then? So in a famous paper, Leonard Jung, 
showed how to deal with biased measurement, but only for the case where the vector field F is a gradient vector field. So I don't know what to do with the general case. And this is my uh, last substantive slide. All these results are asymptotic. Now, there is a new field called finite time stochastic approximation. We try to give you finite time estimate. This sort of reminds me of the stuff I was working on about 25 years ago called talk learning theory, probably approximately correct. I, I haven't had enough time to read my, uh, educate myself on finite time stochastic approximation, primarily because I've been to visit modeling this coronavirus. I think it's about time that uh, I say goodbye to that and I get back to you know this kind of stuff. But I think there's some uh, interesting work to be done. So then they look at it today. Huh? So if you were to run the optimal policy uh -huh. and if you were to run your scheme, every time you're making a wrong decision, you're suffering some rigor. Yeah. So you want to bow the motor rigor. Well, I mean that getting like your area of bandit problems and regret bounding and stuff like that. I, I think that is so difficult. <laughs> Some of these young people in the audience, they have to work on the very messy. It's very, 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 very difficult problem. Uh, but the, but there, is a, there is a guy called John Ligero, the ETH Zurich, mm -hmm. who's sort of working on regret bounding for more publication processes. So, it's all yeah, I'm a little bit mistrustful of hot areas because by the time I learned enough about it, it's no longer hard. So I leave the I leave the working on hot areas to much younger people. So this is just a one slide pitch for tomorrow's lecture. The idea is that in bus in batch asynchronous stochastic approximation, you update some but not all components of this unknown vector theta. And uh, so that's what tomorrow's lecture is. Tomorrow, I will not go over time. I have far fewer slides than in today's lecture. But thank you very much for the patience and also thank you for the interest. Uh, always a pleasure to talk to an audience that is very heavily engaged. Tomorrow's lecture is actually, uh, I think, a little easier for people to understand because the learning, the um, Markov decision process motivation is much easier to convey. Today may have been a bit more abstract. Okay, that's all I have to say. So the learning update function that you mentioned, uh -huh. does it satisfy the property? Uh, that because it's not clear that the decision exists, that exists because of the next term. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, it, 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 you basically preempting my lecture tomorrow. So I'll give a one word answer. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <I'm> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks again. Thank you. Brilliant.